You know, only a decade ago, good superhero games were still a hot commodity. For every Arkham Asylum and City, there were endless duds like The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Spider-Man 3, Spider-Man Friend or Foe, oh my god, poor guy. But there was also that one Thor video game that sucked, a Green Lantern game that sucked, multiple Iron Man games that were just fine, and even the Deadpool game that I recently covered on the channel weren't received super well. Superhero games that were worth the price of admission were hard to find, and you'd assume to find them associated with a titan like Spider-Man. But who would have thought that a game about Wolverine would be so good? Well, just about everyone. With the popularity of superhero games being revitalized by the Arkham series and with the God of War series 2 ushering in a new age of gory beat-em-ups, a game featuring a brutal Marvel character was guaranteed to be a recipe for success. Well, okay, I guess you have to bring some originality to the table. So how about instead of bathing in fire, let's bathe in lots and lots of blood. Maybe instead of using a character that had only seen mainstream success from admittedly fun movies, we look to a character who had established wide appeal prior to a movie. Wolverine and the X-Men as a collective were not unfamiliar with great games, though their success was largely across two dimensions. When it came to the 3D stuff, Wolverine hadn't taken home any awards until the release of X-Men Origins Wolverine. Ask anyone at the time if they thought this game was good, and they'd say that on paper it was repetitive, had pacing issues, and lacked an engaging story. But in spite of it all, they enjoyed what was there. Because the gameplay was so fun, fluid, and had so much room for creativity that they still came back to it. If you asked me a week ago, I'd say I never played it. Look, I'm sorry, I heard it was good, but it just never appealed to me as much as the bat and the spider. Plus, if I want a short, feisty Canadian, I can just look to my girlfriend. But on a random, sunny day, bored of the usual Ubisoft slop, I downloaded it, and my god, I had no idea what I was missing. Released in 2009 across many different consoles, I want to clarify that today's video will be in regards to the Uncaged Edition that was released for the PS3 and Xbox 360, as it features the most in-depth gameplay, best-looking environments, and a stupid amount of gore. This was the most staggering part of playing the game. Wolverine is absolutely brutal. Every takedown ends in an explosion of ketchup, and the only thing capable of not being blown away is Logan's adamantium skeleton, and of course, the toughest jeans the world has ever seen. Which is almost as badass as a sponsor today video, Stallcraft X. Taking place in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, Stallcraft X sees you and some friends trying to survive and uncover the mysteries behind the anomalies happening within the zone, and strange artifacts with supernatural powers. Taking place online and being unforgiving because of it means every person's journey is unique, and I can have a direct impact on another player's story. The gameplay loop involves you and some friends going on expeditions for loot, and often running into other enemies or NPCs in a large-scale faction war before returning to your customizable shelter to regroup and head back into the wasteland. Land. While this game is by all means tough, it has an art style that's oddly charming, and the game has a brand new animation system to give it an added layer of production value. Gameplay itself focuses on slick gunplay, and the enhanced AI makes interacting with NPCs more enjoyable as they naturally become better in combat, learning to take cover, and more. Plus, the game is completely free, and there are no items exclusive to microtransactions, meaning you can get the full experience without paying a dime. And for new players, you can get a bonus reward using the link in the description or pinned comment. So download Stallcraft X now, become a legend of the zone and figure out what the hell is going on in there. Thanks to Solcraft X for sponsoring this portion of the video. With Insomniac leading the charge on another Wolverine game, I think looking back on X-Men Origins Wolverine could teach us lessons about how to make Wolverine work in a video game, and I'll give you a hint, there's a lot to learn. Let's start first with the way the game looks, because if we're going to let players play as Wolverine, they need to see Wolverine. Not just the character, but the mindset. Logan is constantly moving with this animalistic aggression, grunting and growling with each swipe, stab, and slam. The game is very much of its time with a dark, gritty approach to realism, but with that in mind, the fidelity is quite nice. While I'm not seeing the game through rose-tinted goggles, I am certainly seeing it through emulated ones. As like all these Activision Marvel games, they are no longer being sold, and I had no luck with a physical copy. Fortunately, it runs great on emulators offering 60 FPS and upscaling to, in my case, 1080p no problem. Environments look good, though I wish we didn't spend so much time in the jungle, as its aesthetic wears off quickly, and yet we do nothing but return to it after experiencing much prettier locales. In this case, the game opens on its worst note, as the Weapon X facility in the jungle didn't do much to entertain me, especially when compared to Gambit's Casino and the Snowfield. Despite aesthetic preferences, I can't deny that they all looked good, and this applies to the characters as a whole. While the voice acting was good when I could actually fucking hear it, I wish the soundtrack was 
was more prevalent. But maybe this is a lame criticism, because if there's any game where the sounds of metal ripping flesh drowns out background music, it's a Wolverine game. But environments don't totally matter, because our eyes are always locked on those claws, and my god, the animation work is exceptional here. I used to talk about animations a lot, and if I made this video in 2020, you can bet your ass it would be 90% of this video. The sheer force Wolverine exerts, the buttery slickness at which those claws enter guts is just addictive, and the many executions that see Logan ripping someone in half, ripping their head off, ripping their arm off, and then beating them with said arm makes even the most mundane of encounters a feast for the eyes. There are plenty of moments here where cutscenes do what gameplay generally couldn't, and even these are fun because the choreography is so damn fun. Sometimes the cool things on screen are glorified quick time events like the helicopter takedowns, but my criticism is always tapered by the feeling in that moment where Logan rips the pilot out of the cockpit and you think, oh god, please put his head into the blade, Woo! Where the game really showcases the impressive animation work is when combining moves together to create combos that feel as though they were canned, pre-made moves, when in reality it's the product of player creativity. Canned moves are still here, like the super moves or the environmental takedowns, but when they are well balanced in gameplay and look like this, again, I know, broken record, it's fine. The cutscenes themselves are usually fine enough, and the pre-rendered ones look decent enough too, but otherwise this game is light on cutscenes, which is a massive strength when the gameplay looks like this. This isn't to say the game lacks downtime, it certainly does, but it's to say that most of the brutality is experienced within gameplay. Said gameplay is damn good, though it's not entirely false to say that what you see in the first hour is largely what you'll get. Opening in the jungle, we get introduced to some regular goons that don't do much damage, perfect for allowing players to find their footing. There's no formal tutorial here aside from the occasional dialogue box, so most of what I learned is from trial and error. In most cases, I would call this a flaw, but here, because there was so much room to experiment, and because the essentials are taught to the player, I never felt ill-equipped at any point. Combat revolves around three major facets, lunging, grabbing, and countering. The lunge is executed by first locking onto a target, which is an issue because sometimes you aren't allowed to lock onto the person you want, and in other times you won't lunge at all. When targeting a crowd, you'll need to be sure you're lunging at the person you want. Enemies with guns can be a threat at any position, so prioritizing them is wise. But if I have to keep swapping targets before it gets to the one I want, then it breaks the flow of gameplay and could lead to death. With that said, I didn't die at all on my playthrough aside from falling outside the map, and most times when I locked on, it went exactly where I wanted it to, even when picking enemies out of a crowd where you'd think a lock-on would get lost. Once you close the gap with an enemy, you could hit them with the basic light and heavy attacks, and that'll get the job done well. But where you'll get the best damage is in grabbing an opponent. Once doing so, you can punch, throw, or execute a finishing attack by nailing a pretty easy quick time event. Grabbing is so busted in this game because it can be used to throw enemies off a cliff or building, it can be used to get free damage on a tough enemy, or even to use the iframes given when executing someone to regenerate some health. It's both the perfect combo starter and ender depending on how it's used, but some enemies can't be grabbed, so you'll have to rely on the final major facet of combat, counters, and guarding. Guarding severely reduces the amount of damage you take from most attacks, and if releasing your guard at the right time, you can perform a parry that opens an enemy for a counterattack. This ability will be key to winning every single boss fight, and it gives a solid layer of risk and reward to combat as the timing for this is tight enough to require proper focus. You could also consider the rage abilities a major facet too, but I don't because I found them less personal than grabbing someone and splitting them in two. With that said, the best players will be prioritizing targets, cycling abilities, and making use of iframes to stay alive. The reason these three may be four facets of gameplay are most important is because they are the kinds of different attacks that can be combined together to create combos. There is no combo meter, or even a style meter for that matter, so measuring what is and isn't a combo will be defined by me, and I consider it any consecutive attack that cannot be broken by the receiver of said attacks. With that in mind, it was common to lunge at an enemy to start an encounter and then shift to a grab or an uppercut to send them into the air before slamming them back down. For the final boss, I was able to counter him, grab him in the air, and perform an execution, dealing insane damage, and it never became less satisfying. I do attribute this to the animation work more than anything, but even with how addicted I was to the combat, I noticed the repetition. Let me walk you through how enemies are introduced in this game. We get guys with swords, guys with guns, nothing wrong there. Then we get noticeably stronger sword guys, and then there's a fight against a golem where we need to jump on its back and take it down. Then we fast forward to the present day to take down enemies with guns and ones with swords. Then there's an exciting mini boss against a mutant that is best damaged by jumping on its back. 
Do you notice a trend? This continues throughout the game. Enemies often aren't more than punching bags, and while there are some very fun mix-ups, the shielded enemies that need to be staggered before being taken down come to mind as a favorite, but otherwise players need to motivate themselves to engage with the combat beyond just grabbing and executing over and over again. This was an issue I ran into, thinking, damn, every enemy goes down the same way. And while I think some of the blame can be put on the game in this instance, they could have done more to encourage me to experiment, it's ultimately my fault for not using more of my toolkit. Though there is one enemy class I wish would disappear, and that's the ones that disappear. Yeah, I don't know how that got through the proofread. Point is, you have to use a Detective Vision-esque tool to sniff them out, but they use shotguns that stun the hell out of you, and they're often invulnerable to lunges, making the most effective means of dispatching them the old grab-and-execute method. The teleporting enemies in the jungle have a similar function, except they force you to play more on the defensive. If you don't, you're sure to be stunned, but if you predict where they're going to teleport, then you can grab them and make quick work of them. Other enjoyable enemies were those with unique weapons, because they usually meant a unique takedown was associated with them, but otherwise, there isn't much here that that drastically changes your playstyle or priorities. Despite my gripes, encounters are still fun, and I really should stress that, though there were some levels where I questioned the design. Said mutant mini-bosses were a lot of fun, the first time. The third time? Well, okay, that's fine, I guess. The fifth time? Okay, guys, something new would be nice, and then we get four of them in a row in place of a boss battle. Why the fuck would we do this? It doesn't matter that much because to me this was the worst of the level design, and it's not even that bad. And otherwise, the level design is a fun mix of combat, boss fights, puzzles that were actually enjoyable enjoyable, and set pieces that rivaled Uncharted, at least the first one. To go back to the four mutants back to back, that sequence ends in taking down a series of helicopters, skydiving from one to the next to take out an entire platoon, and moments like this aren't uncommon. Running away from a flood, a helicopter, avoiding traps, chasing down Channing Tatum, it's all good stuff. Ooh, I'm about to make a name for myself here. In between, we'll get small bursts of downtime where we solve puzzles often by interacting with teleporters or moving boxes. Nothing revolutionary, but I won't lie, they actually took some thought and I enjoyed them for what they were. When it comes to finding what is interactable, you have a hunter vision, but I appreciate that I never felt like I always had to use it, something I did feel in other games with similar mechanics. Puzzles always had the pieces laid out intuitively, and I wasn't lost on any of them for long, which is appreciated in what is otherwise not a puzzle game. Most chapters end with a boss fight, and these are definitely the game's bread and butter. X-Men Origins knows what the people want, because until this game, we had not had another bar fight with Logan since Ultimate Spider-Man, and it looks just as good as it was there. The boss fights are often just two people with healing abilities beating the ever-loving shit out of each other until one gets tuckered out, and they don't even need to be more than that, and yet they often are. The boss fight against the Sentinel was fun, though the gimmick of baiting it into electricity got old fast, but it at least ends on an insane high note as we soar through the sky to take it out as we plummet to the ground, and the sheer state of Logan's body after this encounter says it all. Shockingly, despite the boss's tall stature, I never felt like I lost track of what was going on. And that was the case for a lot of the game, which is surprising given how most of the second chapter takes place in a tight, claustrophobic facility. The two fights against Sabretooth were good enough, and the fight against Gambit was probably the best in the game. Taking place across a few different areas of the casino, this fight sees Gambit doing his best to create distance, making this a good fight in the sense that it's not just about close range spamming of the square button, but actually closing the gap consistently, playing aggressive, and deflecting his many cards and the stage hazards. He also cannot be grabbed in the final phase, which made the fight a legitimate challenge. The final fight is against Deadpool, and trust me, we'll talk about the way he's handled here later, but strictly speaking in terms of gameplay, this fight was fine enough, though it does display an issue with the game and that is in both checkpoints and fall damage. Simply put, I don't think falling off of something, especially such a narrow arena like this, should result in complete failure. You can make it take a chunk out of our health bar, sure, but full stop ending the mission is a gut punch, and doubly so when we consider that the checkpoints in this game aren't the most forgiving. In one puzzle, for example, I failed it and died, thus having to go back to the beginning of the room, refighting the enemies and redoing all the setup for the puzzle. Not only did this discourage me from experimenting with the puzzle, but in a platforming sense, it made me terrified of platforming because Logan doesn't control that well in the air. In Deadpool's case, when we fall off the platform, we go back to the very beginning of a two-phase fight. The catch is, when Deadpool enters his second phase, he starts shooting off parts of the platform with his laser eyes. Long story about that. It's not always clear where he's going to shoot, so he may just teleport away, shoot the platform beneath your feet, and you're forced to go back to the beginning. Regardless, this fight was really fun, and I even replayed it specifically a few times because, and god, I know this is a nuclear hot take, I like Deadpool's design in both the movie and the game. Now hold on, hear me out. I don't think the character should be called Deadpool. The character on paper isn't Deadpool. But disconnected from the brutal character assassination, the idea of a super weapon that is an amalgamation of different characters and powers we fought in the game, and his design, is pretty appealing. But perhaps the best fight is the one against yourself. If you collect a certain number of trinkets around some of the levels, you'll unlock a challenge where you fight yourself to unlock a new costume. I am shocked 
at how good this is. I know it's just a mirror match, but seeing an AI use all of your tools against you and having to play around your own abilities was a fun challenge, and the reward warranted another playthrough for me. Overall, X-Men Origins Wolverine on a gameplay front made me nostalgic for a game I hadn't played before because it was just so indicative of a design philosophy of the time, where gameplay was the main priority. I don't mean to sound cynical, but lately it feels like so many games prioritize the stories above the gameplay, and that isn't an incorrect thing to do, but it does feel as though we end up losing some of the fun along the way. Granted, I am saying this in regards to a game that in many ways was simply following the trends of the time, but still, it made me a bit wary of Insomniac's take on the character, because their last few superhero games have continually become more and more cinematic. I trust in Insomniac, they haven't let me down yet, but if there is something to be learned from X-Men Origins Wolverine, then it's that the best way to make a player feel like the character they're controlling is to not just make them look like the character, but to make them think and act like the character. The moments that made me feel the most like Wolverine in this game weren't the cutscenes, quick time events, or anything else where I could virtually drop the controller. It was when I saw a room full of enemies and jumped into the fray, bouncing between fresh meat and tearing whatever my heart desired in the millisecond I had to think about where to next. I fought like a rabid dog, like an animal, and it was icing on top that I was able to look like it too as a reward. Another lesson that could be learned is that we don't need to have enemies do a lot of damage for them to feel threatening. Simply having Logan's head bashed repeatedly into a post or having him thrown across the map gives the impression of an immensely powerful foe without sacrificing the healing factor that admittedly negates a lot of the challenge. Another lesson would be to take notes on this game's story, not in what to do, but in what not to do, because oh man, is this a stinker. Now, this is a tie-in product for a movie of the same name that wasn't received very well at all, but it does deviate from that plot quite a bit. Does it do so in an interesting way? Fuck no. But hey, at least it was a good excuse for the set pieces. Because this game does differ so greatly from the movie, I won't bother making a case for or against it. Generally, my philosophy is that, if a game is meant to tie into the movie, having the story deviate gives someone a reason to experience both and allows both products to tell an interesting story. Unfortunately, in this case, neither tells a good story. The story bounces between Logan's time working with Team X in Africa and his time trying to find his girlfriend three years later once the team has broken up. As Logan enlists the help and aggro of his former teammates, he's able to uncover secret mutant experiments from a scientist who headed the operation, Dr. Stryker. Logan discovered that Stryker wanted to eliminate the mutants and experiment on them, and is creating sentinels capable of killing all of them, and trying to make the perfect mutant killing weapon. Logan was one of these experiments, having his bones coated in adamantium before escaping. Logan eventually tracks his girlfriend down where he has to fight both Sabretooth and Stryker's ultimate weapon, Deadpool. Wade Wilson was one of Stryker's best mutants, aside from being a chronic yapper, and thus found ways to imbue other mutants' powers within him, like Wolverine's claws and healing factor, Will I Am's teleportation, and Cyclops' lasers, though Cyclops doesn't appear in the game. Logan defeats Deadpool, and we cut to a future where Stryker is still around and has deployed Sentinels across the world, leaving us with the potential for a sequel. So, okay, let's talk about some changes and some explanations. Generally, like many movie tie-ins, there's a lot of context missing that would be filled in by watching the movie. However, allow me to use this game an excuse to ask why Fox thought it would be a good idea not only to make Sabretooth Logan's brother, but to butcher Deadpool like this. My only rationalization is that the experiments done to Deadpool, including having his mouth sewn shut, were meant to be his own origin story, where he ends up losing his mind and becoming the more insane version of himself we see in most media nowadays. Because while it isn't shown in the game, in the movie there's a shot at the end where his head is seen with an open mouth, and his face does sort of resemble what Wade's head would normally look like. Maybe in a proper sequel, the character would come back in a more comic accurate way, but regardless, it still sours his inclusion here and in the movie. The game's plot as a whole has a massive pacing issue. The constant flashbacks, and sometimes flashbacks within flashbacks, make it difficult to piece together a decent timeline, and while there are a lot of audio logs that kept me interested in the supplementary lore, most of what is directly shown didn't interest me, nor did I feel invested in any of the characters. Especially when important characters just come and go as they please, aside from Sabretooth and Stryker, and again, the dialogue is awfully quiet, meaning there were a few moments I had to rewind in my footage to fully make out. Ultimately, for a movie tie-in, it's not the worst, especially when compared to Spider-Man 3 or even the Deadpool game to come out a few years later. I find it funny that Deadpool and Wolverine operate on completely opposite ends of their respective video games. Deadpool's game had relatively boring combat but made up for it in its endless jokes and a tone that is unlike any other. Meanwhile, Wolverine's bread and butter is the gameplay with all the story stuff surrounding it being forgettable. If I had to compare the two, I'd say I think Wolverine's game is better in the long run. Don't get me wrong, I love the Deadpool game, but I think it's only good on the first playthrough. 
By the third, you know the jokes, and assuming all of them land, they're gonna start getting old. Wolverine can be played over and over because the appeal is in the gameplay itself. Replay your favorite chapters, challenges, and play the game in different ways. You'll find a wider variety of fun here. So overall, boy howdy did I miss out on what easily could have been one of my favorite superhero games as a kid. X-Men Origins Wolverine is a game that feels tailored to me because it prioritized gameplay and fun over story, which again seems to be the opposite these days. I'm one of those people that if I had to pick between a game with fun gameplay and a bad story, or a good story and bad gameplay, I'd go for the good gameplay every single time. Because ultimately, good gameplay is the only thing you can strictly get from a game. I can get a good story from a book, I can get good visuals from a movie, but good gameplay, a good tactile feedback loop where I control what happens, can only be found here. I genuinely believe that Insomniac is looking to this game for inspiration on their upcoming Wolverine game, because why wouldn't they? It's clearly one of the best games to feature the character. In the last few months, I won't lie, I wasn't super hyped about Insomniac's Wolverine, but now that I've played this, I can't wait! I know I sang this game's praises a lot, but I don't want it to seem like I think this game's a masterpiece. It isn't. But man, if this game isn't a banger 7 out of 10. It's a dying breed of game, one that's heavily rough around the edges, but it has some redeeming qualities. I've mentioned before when talking about games like Hulk Ultimate Destruction that they simply don't make games like this anymore, and I've since realized that the reality is, they can't. When a game isn't firing on all cylinders in every facet, story, gameplay, graphics, they get left in the dust. I mean, we went from people defending games like Web of Shadows in spite of its numerous flaws, to people saying that Insomniac Spider-Man 2 is unironically terrible. How did that happen? I, I, I don't know. I guess what I'm trying to say is, maybe we need to abandon this hyper-cinematic style of game and return to the days where we could just have games that were dumb fun, and we enjoyed them in spite of whatever flaws there were. Just because they were fun. Also, Spider-Man 2 fucking sucks! Ah! Okay, chill, chill. I I actually like Spider-Man 2, I'm sorry. I, I just thought it was a funny way to end the video. But what I also actually really like is our patrons who support this channel, and I want to give a shout out to them. Their names are on screen right now. Thank you so much for everything that you guys do for me. Thank you for watching this video as well. I had a lot of fun making it. I know it's not Spider-Man 2. I, uh, I said Spider-Man 2 would be the next video after my Deadpool video, and then there's been Borderlands, and now this. I promise, the next one is guaranteed Spider-Man. Probably. Anyways, thank you all for watching. I hope you have an excellent day, and uh, follow my Twitter down below. Take care, love you guys, and see you next time.